it's a tall order talking about George Skipper's architecture because he practiced for more than 70 years and in fact was buried on what would have been his 92nd birthday. Fortunately, almost all his best buildings were constructed in the centre of Norwich during one decade in the middle of his life, and this will be the emphasis of my talk. But I'll also try to put this achievement into context, and this is helped by Richard Barnes' recent publication, George Skipper, The Architect's Life and Works, which, apart from magnificent illustrations, is the first to attempt a complete survey of his career and will undoubtedly be a useful starting point for further research. We know George Skipper then from spectacular designs such as this Italian palazzo, formerly known as Telephone House, um, which he built for the Norwich and London Accident Insurance Association in St Giles. And of course, we know Surrey House, the headquarters of Aviva and the Royal Arcade, all of which will come later. But throughout his career, he, he also took, let's move that out of the way, he also took on more routine commissions. In Norwich, for example, uh, he designed houses in Grove Avenue, Ella Road, Magdalen Street. He worked on the Earlham and Mile Cross estate. And even in, in his late 70s, he was designing houses in Christchurch Road. What you see here is, I think, one of his most appealing Norwich terraces. Um, and, and note the surviving original chimney stack on the left and the most attractive door cases. And this is another interesting example built for his stone mason potter, which shows the interest in Tudor that marked his earlier career. So, to go back to the beginning, he was an East Anglian boy uh, it, it's quite possible that he only made the one trip abroad that I've mentioned here, but he did travel a lot in England. He amassed a fine architectural library and also kept it up by means of such journals as the builder to which he contributed. His membership of the Plymouth Brethren may help to explain his reputation as a Dur character and also why, unlike his near contemporary Edward Boardman, he played almost no part in Norwich's public life. Breakthrough came at the age of 23 when he won a competition uh, for a hospital in Somerset and this led to a great deal of other work in that part of the country, as you can see. Buildings at this stage tend to reflect a prevailing interest in a comfortable kind of uh, Tudor domestic building. And a good example are these um, appealing workers' cottages. Now, as in Norwich, Skipper puts his dress on the facade and the street view, but here the effect is much more three-dimensional. He chooses to work in local materials and designs these to blend in with the village, which is very different from Norwich where the buildings are meant to stand out. Here, the gentle Tudor combines with a Gothic doorway, whereas in Norwich, the stress is classical. But what they share 
is, first of all, evidence of Skipper's adaptability. And both in Norwich and here, he shows a fondness for the asymmetrical and an interest in the skyline and a great deal of care over detail. Um, also, while we're in Somerset, here is an example of Skipper's whimsy, a clock tower in a kind of Germanic Gothic revival, built for Clark's shoe village, uh, but apparently Mrs. Clark thought it too, too folkly for her taste. So that's a brief account of the Somerset years. The next phase begins with another competition win, this time for Cromer Town Hall. Uh, by the time this happened, he was going into partnership or planning partnership with his younger brother, Frederick, and he'd also been honoured by becoming a fellow of the RIBA, so a rising star. Um, what, why Town Hall in Cromer? Well, here's the reason. New arrival of railway lines and Cromer wanting to become an upmarket resort, so it needed some significant public buildings. Um, the facade we look at here is more modelled than in Somerset, and it's actually beginning to move from the Tudor to something more classical. Uh, unfortunately, it's been painted, which rather ruins the original effect, which was in red cossiware moulded brick from Gunton's. And if we look on the right hand side, you can see what that should have looked like. So, commissions followed for three hotels, of which only one survives. And the Hotel de Paris is actually uh, set above the pier, which was a bit later, and is really just a vast new front to older buildings. At this time, um, big Victorian piles in brick and terracotta were spreading through the cities of England, partly through the example of Alfred Waterhouse, who was responsible for prudential buildings in London and Nottingham. Um, Skipper's Hotel is very large indeed, and I don't think he was that happy working on this scale. However, Nicholas Pevsner in the Buildings of England compares it to the Chateau of Chambord. My only comment is, if only. But it's worth a glance at the Cossieware detail. Here are two more. You can see uh, stylized fish on the left and what I suppose are cornucopias on the right. And inside the entrance hall certainly gives a foretaste of the imagination Skipper will apply to his Norwich work um, and a variety of materials. Note the stained glass skylight. And then there's a vaguely Elizabethan pseudo chimney press because it's actually the reception desk. And carved wooden pedants, I should say pendants. Um, 
and, and note the scrolls. However, at this stage, I feel that Skipper has done little to distinguish himself from other Victorian architects, but that changes when he gets going in the centre of Norwich. And this is the first of the 10 buildings constructed in Norwich between 1896 and 1906, which have been called fireworks. And as you can see, it is saturated with costly wear decoration. He moved his offices here from Opie Street, building the right half first and the left as an afterthought a few years later. I'll explain this by reducing it to one bay. And I think that Skipper could well have been inspired by his visit to Belgium. Maybe these houses or something like them or even something more elaborate, who knows, all drawing the facade together under one gable. But this style was already becoming popular in England. Here are two examples in Fleet Street. I have no information about the building on the left, which had clearly been altered later at the top, but both of them share with the offices of Skipper the pattern of a shop at the bottom, then an oriel, then an arch, and then a gable. The building on the left also employs plenty of moulded brick, but obviously not costly ware, which is a Norris speciality. And both of them take a lot of care over detail. Uh, so they have pilasters with unusual capitals, for example. However, Skipper's facade is far more elaborate. And it's worth remembering that at this time, uh, architects were not allowed to advertise. Now, I think in a way his building is a kind of practical example of his skill. So he therefore puts in as much cosyware as he can manage, and the result is elaborate, ingenious, and arguably quite confusing. Um, a sense of dense decoration, all classical. Um, he uses Stilted arches, which I suppose you could call Romanesque, worked pilasters, twisted columns with, with a string, which you can see, and um, intriguing capitals actually with reversed volutes, and a face which is perhaps the face of Skipper himself. Maybe he is distancing himself from Boardman, who worked on the other side of the road in a Venetian Gothic. We'll come to that in a second. So there are the pilasters, and there's, there's Boardman. Shop has changed hands, of course. Uh, Skipper now, as I say, turned decisively away from Gothic, at least in Norwich.
below the Venetian windows, which you can see under the eyebrow arches, a skipper put in six moulded, no, sculpted Cossiware panels um, to display aspects of the architect's work. And so going even closer to a piece of advertisement. And the one on the left, remember, which was later, completed about 1904, shows a uh, skipper uh, in the top hat with his second wife, his small son, George, and the dog, because his wife was a daughter of a vet. And he is. Um, displaying to a thoughtful client an architectural feature with stonemasons on the right and some of the buildings he designed in the background there for example is Surrey House. Ironically this kind of decoration in Cosiwa was going out of fashion about 1900 and so the next building after his offices is a real surprise, the Royal Arcade. It was commissioned by Sir Kenneth Kemp, who was chairman of uh, hotel syndicates for whom Skipper worked in Cromer. And the idea was to bring the new fashion for arcade shopping to Norwich. So that was an early view. This is a modern one but you must ignore the lighting. Now, the shape of the shop windows that goes back to uh, the West End of London, the Burlington Arcade, a very early arcade, and Norwich is on the left here. Obviously, what Kemp was doing was showing that his arcade was really high class. Uh, can you see the differences? Well, one, which will be clear in a moment, is that the Burlington Arcade is straight and the Royal Arcade is not. Originally, the Angel Inn, the site became the Royal Hotel in 1846. And the facade still survives on Gentleman's Walk. Um, the space became vacant with the construction of Boardman's modern Royal Hotel on Bank Plain. Pesner calls this a perfectly innocent front, but goes on to say that the arcade is very naughty once its back is turned. And the site was a very awkward one, with the two entrances not lying opposite each other. Skipper solved the problem brilliantly, first by setting the arcade off centre at the walk, which you could probably detect here, uh, and then by introducing a kink a few steps in and putting a further change of direction in the middle of the arcade, as is clear from this 1935 picture taken when it was decked out for George V's Silver Jubilee. Instead of decorative brick, this is the first of four buildings Skipper had faced in glazed Dalton tiles. And the major impact comes, as you can see, at the Castle Street entrance, where all sorts of fanciful elements are packed into a small space. It's probably the nearest we get in England to Art Nouveau, not just because of all the organic elements in the coloured tiles, now rather faded, but because of the way that the different architectural elements flow into each other. If you look at the curved gable over the arch, for example, it's flanked by wave-like scrolls as if it is washing away. And then you can see above the Art Nouveau lettering, uh, three Doric columns 
which take us back to the 500s BC and may seem completely out of place. Except that Gaudi, whom Betjeman compared with Skipper, also combined Greek Doric with organic forms in his work. I admit that this is slightly later. Now, at the top of the arcade arch, the keystone is extended into a pedestal with a female head, rather like a classical home. This is from the Getty Museum. But actually, of course, it's an angel, the angeling, with upspread wings filling the top of the gable and lower down turning into a floral motif. And this fluidity seems to me very much in the spirit of Art Nouveau. Um, possibly Skipper was thinking of this remarkable piece by Gilbert. Uh, we know that the tomb was on display, though incomplete, in July 1898, so it's just possible. And apart from the swirls, the angels of both Gilbert and Skipper have very similar hairstyles. Well, the Dolphin Tiles are the work of W. J. Neatby, who was in charge of architectural ceramics at the Dolphin Factory. And here he's using arts and crafts designs with a touch of Art Nouveau. No time to go into Neatby's remarkable work in Norwich now, but I'd like to point out that, as in other buildings, Skipper was very clever at employing talented workmen who would blend with his overall design, and that again is very much in the arts and crafts tradition. Skipper went to add a tiled finish to three other Norwich buildings, but before moving on to the next, let's put the last one in context. We've seen the influence of the Burlington Arcade and the Arts and Crafts movement and the controversial world of Art Nouveau, which some English artists hated. But the use of polychrome finishes probably goes back to Waterhouse's Natural History Museum, uh, which was based in durable glazed terracotta from Tamworth. Of course, this Romanesque ecclesiastical style was not for Skipper, but here are a couple of details. Very effective. So back to Norwich. And Haymarket Chambers, which again has tiles and is the first of Skipper's buildings to suggest an Italian palazzo. In this case, I think the Peruzzi Palace on the right, both of them have curved facades, both are seven bays wide and have similar windows. Haymarket Chambers was built for J. H. Roof, the grocer, and above it was meant for the offices of Norwich Stock Exchange, though possibly it was never used as such. It's really three buildings in one. There's a palazzo style to suggest opulence. There are flanking tile towers to suggest a castle. And then the lower facade has arches over where would have been the shop windows. And the parts tend to overlap. Uh, towers, presumably, in order to suggest that your money 
was as secure as in a castle. But perhaps it was tongue in cheek, as these look more like toy town towers than the real thing. And notice these wonderfully crafted tiles in contrasting colours and the cornice and a lozenge of a ship in full sail, supposedly a symbol of good fortune, but maybe too much like a cartoon ship to be taken seriously. Now look at the facade again. You can see that it's unclear where the first floor belongs. There are three extremely grand windows with elaborate keystones and broken ped pediments, but between them are two arches with round openings that definitely belong to the shop. And the more you look at this facade, the more intricate and complicated it is. And another feature is that it's not like a TARDIS, but the opposite it looks very spacious on the outside, actually quite pokey inside. Now, another tower building here is the left hand one of two by Skipper. Um, and this is his contribution to the redevelopment of the southeast side of Red Lion Street, uh, carried out jointly with Edward Boardman after its widening to accommodate trams. Um, here is a glimpse of those two buildings plus a uh, uh, part of one by Boardman's son. And notice the sequence of Flemish gables, though one of them, it has to be said, is pretty unconventional. Commercial chambers in the middle there was built for the accountant Charles Larking. And like the London Street offices, you see it, it is a Flemish front with a shop below, an oriel, an arch, and a gable, and as a bonus, a mini campanile on the right. Uh, it's a teasing and ambiguous building again, because you can read it, as I said, as a Flemish building with a tower, or you can read it as a monumental temple front supported by three pilasters and surmounted by a heavy entablature, or you can read it as a grand arch interrupted by the entablature. And at the top, there's a kind of figured keystone. Um, the oriel is very grand. You can see from this, the ground floor shows a fascination with Baroque decoration. And the keystone does not turn into an angel, but on it is perched what? Well, I think it is um, a portrait of George Skipper, posing as an Old Testament prophet, who is posing as an accountant sitting in a niche. But the whole building shows a fascinating way in which you can see architectural ideas evolving and metamorphosing in Skipper's mind. Now on the right, very briefly, the Norfolk and Norwich Savings Bank. Um, what we know about this is that it was originally designed to go in Magdalene Street and is the first of the architect's stone-fronted palazzi. Um, the ground floor is sadly altered. 
the windows on either side, the ones with blocked half columns, are directly derived from a palazzo by Palladio, the great Palladio, the uh, Palazzo Tiene from the 16th century, but there's still quite a lot more work to be done on that one. So I will move to the next, which we all know, and to the world of Grand Edwardian Baroque. Um, Skipper won another national competition for this building made for the Norwich Union Life Insurance Society and on the site of the Earl of Surrey's 16th century house in Surrey Street, and it has a good measure of Edwardian swagger. It also says a great deal about the Norwich Union's aspirations. Their president said in 1906 that the new house was stable, solidly built and built for all time, perfect for its intended use. I believe he was influenced by two local 18th century houses in the style of Palladio, Holcomb and Houghton. I'm just showing you Houghton here. And like Houghton, Surrey House has end pavilions uh, and a central portico with ionic columns and a triangular pediment. And both of them actually have single story wings, so you can't see them. However, Surrey House is far more exuberant. It's like a condensed version of Houghton, if you like, smaller in scale and intensified. And I think also that he was influenced by Florentine Renaissance buildings such as this one, which I would expect to have been illustrated in his library. Um, so if you look at these three buildings, you can see that in all three, the impression is that the grand rooms come on the first floor of the Piano Nobile. Um, in the Palazzo Medici, uh, the ground floor is used for commercial purposes and the staircase led up in the courtyard. In Surrey House, the rustication gives an impression that the ground floor is more humble in intention, though actually that's not quite true when you enter the building. The building itself is extraordinary for the way the light and shade plays on it, and that's because of the deeply undercut Clipsham stone. Uh, at the arch over the entrance uh, reminds us of the symbolism of the building, and actually what it shows is a winged hourglass. So inside, the former general office colonnaded with a low dome and more than a passing resemblance to a central courtyard. So there is the Medici Palace again. Um, in the case of the Medici Palace, the arches come on top of the columns. In the case of Surrey House, the entablature breaks the two. Um, there you can see it. Uh, and there are some fascinating features. Um, these strange sarcophagi, are they a kind of memento mori for the clients down below? And a, a, an almost baroque pulpit, I don't really understand. 
um, it was outside the director's room. And a strange round temple, which is actually part of the innovative air conditioning, is like a high renaissance miniature. The marble was a late addition when a consignment unexpectedly became available that was originally intended for Westminster Cathedral. Uh, it cost £5,000 extra, but Skipper clearly persuaded the directors to pay for it. And he also gave them a sumptuous mahogany boardroom, uh, which I don't have a general view, but it does have these remarkable matching fireplaces in a quirky style. There's one, there's the other. Some people think that the sphinxes have the face of Princess Mary, later Queen Mary. Well, Skipper's fees for Surrey House were £4,264. And aware of his status, he duly became Norwich's second car owner, and by all reports, a pretty dangerous one at that. So how did Surrey House compare with other grandiose Edwardian Baroque buildings? This by a leading London architect with a tall tower you can't see, um, shows the tradition going back to Sir Christopher Wren. Um, but I think probably that Skipper benefited from the more restraining influence of his 18th century models. So at this point, I will just put the pictures I've shown you in sequence with the other of his major buildings that I've not talked about, um, so you can see how things develop. So those are the architect's offices, which we've talked about, and the Royal Arcade, likewise. This building uh, comes uh, just after the Royal Arcade, with rather sombre tiles to suggest stone, and it shows Skipper's fondness for interesting skyline. Um, you can see, let me show you in a moment one link, um, you can see a stepped down small campanile to a huge gable and then a turret which is reminiscent of on the right Norman Shaw's new Scotland Yard built 10 years before and very well known. Uh, originally, this miniature Campanile had a wonderful and large projecting clock, which is sadly lost now. And this is another view of it. Maybe that's a better view. Now, after this building, we get the Haymarket Chambers. Then we get Red Lion Street with the stone Palladian front and the 18th century stone Palladian building in Surrey Street. And after that comes Jarrell's. Jarrell's was built in stages. The London Street frontage first and falls somewhere short of Skipper's vision, which you can see on the left. Uh, which would have had an elaborate tower, and particularly so, the problem was changes in its plan being applied by a cost conscious client. It was his only attempt at a department store, and I reckon he struggled with it. And in a way, the most coherent part is the earlier London Street frontage, especially if you block out the canopy 
and imagine that the main entrance beneath the curved oriel which I've shown on the right. After that, the Norwich and London Accident Insurance Association with a, another dramatic skyline has a very long facade which has been criticised in such a narrow street but following Renaissance examples I think he was considering the perspective view. So up there on the skyline we had balustrades and urns and as with Surrey House projecting end and central bays, subtle range of colour, marble and Portland stone and Monk's Park stone, a recessed attic story and very refined detail as I will show you here and here and then the central doorway astonishing where you have paired Doric columns in marble supporting a rich open swan's neck pediment round there and behind that a rusticated and chamfered round arch that's here and then another rusticated arch on top with a prominent keystone and this time an open pediment spectacular so to his final big norwich building down the way from gerald's and as you know now the iv another stone face palazzo but much less dramatic and reflects a calming down of taste as that decade progressed. So there's smoother rustication compared with Surrey House. The upper stories are less recessed and a surprisingly uneventful skyline. Um, but details are still very refined and include scalloped window arches probably derived from Wren and here's what might be a fairly direct source I don't know so in a way quite a simple building but that's to ignore the right hand bay which breaks the rhythm completely um, breaks a cornice, has a really willful um, design overall, big mullions and balusters, oversized cartouche beneath the balcony. And the contrast would have been even more striking had Skipper been allowed, as he intended, to erect an open lantern with dome and tall finial about this curved bay on the right. That takes us through the Norwich years and after that his architecture is generally much less interesting. He became involved in local authority housing and town planning. He married for a third time and fathered Edward who became an architect and Margaret who was born in the year Skipper was aged 65 and as he lost a lot of money in 1924 from a failed scheme for colliery in Kent he had to keep working and set up a London office to deliver, he hoped, a scheme in Sackville Street. Problem was that it was unashamedly anti-modernist and Baroque with projecting classical pavilions punctuating the facade and was not built as he wanted, though in the Lloyds building 
at the Piccadilly end, we have slight echoes of the earlier skipper. But I don't want to end on that note. And so I'd like to return to just one more project in Norfolk rather than Norwich from his finest period. And as you can see, it is a remarkable one. This is a front view of Senno Park, complete with a detached water tower disguised as a campanile and equipped with bells. Thomas Albert Cook bought the Senno estate around 1900. He was the grandson of Thomas Cook who founded the travel firm, but Albert was a bon viveur rather than a businessman and sold out his share in a highly profitable business to buy Senno. Uh, he was a keen sportsman and the house is full of hunting motifs. Here's at Albert Cook, commission skipper, and then left him to get on with the work while he travelled in Europe for two years. Um, what he came back to was the makeover to end all makeovers as this was the original house. A uh, simple five bay building and alterations were immense as you can see. Um, and when Albert Cook came back from his travels, he said it was all great, but where was the ballroom? So Skipper had to come back again and put in the winter garden on the left to serve as a ballroom. Here we can see the original house was given a kind of new dressing and the dress was in Queen Anne style with white brick and what are known as mathematical tiles, tiles to look at like bricks. The south elevation seems um, English Queen Anne, as I say, but the centre of the east side strikes me more as like Central European Baroque. Perhaps Skipper intended the whole building to be a mini corpse tour, who knows? Interior shows Skipper's relish for historicism and his skill in finding craftsmen. Here's a staircase and an internal porch, Tudor style. Dining room has a fireplace looking like a Baroque altar and carvings in the manner of Grinling Gibbons. Then in the grounds, there's a boathouse top left with a Diocletian window and apparently a crown post roof. Uh, bottom left, a grand classical entrance to the stables, um, which copies or gets near to one originally in Burlington House. Then top right, one of a pair of gatehouses on Norwich Road with towers, lanterns and a three bay loggia. And below that, um, a sequence of wonderfully crafted oval brick niches may be derived from Hampton Court and presumably meant to be populated by statues. Finally, there's also a set of keystones featuring this head. I wonder whether this is a joke on Skipper's part. Is he portraying himself under the stress of hard work? Or is he unwittingly looking to the collapse of Edwardian splendor 
a few years away and the struggles of his later career. Who knows? I leave you with that thought. <laughs>